Hallelujah. The theme of our uh, church this month is called The Heart of Purity and the Spirit of Strength. The reason why we want to talk about this topic is because the Lord desires us to be pure. The Lord wants to sanctify us. The Lord wants to purify us. He wants to make us a people of righteousness. And He wants to give us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of strength. This is taken from Psalm 51 that you have just sung. And the background of this Psalm 51 was written during the crisis moment in King David's life. King David has faced Goliath. King David has faced the Philistine. He has faced enemy. He has faced even King Saul, you know, who was his father-in-law and that King Saul even wanted to kill him. And King David had overcome. But one person that he couldn't face was a lady called Bathsheba. And the reason why her name is called Bathsheba because she took a bath on the roof. So it's called Bathsheba. So never take a bath on the roof. Take it in your bathroom. <laughs> All right. But anyway, you know the story. So the sin of David was far more grievous than the sin of King Saul. David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and also murdered her husband, Uriah. So you find that if I were to tell you that here is a pastor who took a member's wife and killed a member, do you think you want to come to this church? <laughs> no, we don't want to come to this church anymore. And this is exactly the kind of image that you must have of King David, that he was a very terrible person as terrible as I am, as terrible as you are. Because it's easy for us to judge him until one day when it happens to us. So let's see. So what happened when the Lord God, he saw all these things, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. He began to tell him a parable. And he said, the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except for one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate at his own food. Uh, he ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one, of, one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. Which means that the rich man now, he got some gas and he got to kill a lamb. And he took the poor man's lamb and he prepared it for the man who had come to him. So that's the story of Nathan. And what happened? So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said, as the Lord live, the man who has done this shall surely die. What did he do? He was judging another man. It's always easy for us to judge another person until we realize that person is yourself. He didn't know. He heard the story. He was a king. He passed judgment. And he got the power of life and death. If he said, you die, you die. So he said, the man must die. But that was not put into the law. He actually implemented this law himself. The law of Moses did not require the person who stole the lamb, all right, to die. But just to repay four times, four lambs, yeah? So then he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So he began to pass judgment because why? Because he was judging another person. Did you see it's so easy for us to judge other people? And then what happened? And Nathan said to David, 
So you are judging. Let me tell you who that man is. It's you. Nathan, under the anointing of God, under the instruction of God, he said, it's you. You are the man. And David suddenly got a root shock in his life. And David, you know, he bowed down. He said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. There's something about David is that he got this heart for the Lord. Anything from the Lord, he would accept. But when the Lord was like far away, he could commit sin. He looked at a beautiful woman and then he wanted her. And he was the king. He told his attendant, go and bring that woman to me. And Bathsheba was so afraid and she came. And he slept with her. And she became pregnant. And so he said, now I'm going to cover this sin. So the first sin was that he committed adultery. And then the second sin was what? He wanted to cover that sin. So he sent Uriah to come back. All right. Uriah came back, but Uriah was a real soldier. He was a warrior. He said, I will not go back to my house to lay down with my wife. Because why? Because all my men and all my soldiers and all the commanders, they are now in the battlefield. They are fighting and they are losing their life. And therefore, I cannot enjoy myself. And that's a true warrior. What a loyal man. He slept at the gate of the palace. He slept outside with the soldiers. That was a true loyal man. But David became very heartless because he got to cover his sin. Sometimes when you have sin, you will do all kinds of things to cover and even destroy life. And that's exactly what happened. He gave a letter to Uriah and he said, give it to your commander, Job, uh, Joab. Give it to him. In the letter was a sentence for his death. He gave the letter of death sentence to the very man he's going to kill. And that man was the husband of his lover. Can you see? So you see such a despicable act. Then you say, oh, this David is horrible. It is talking about us. It's not talking about David. We can be just as despicable as David. Even though David would, you know, 150 psalms, many psalms were written by David. He wrote songs from young, since a shepherd boy, he worshipped the Lord. Some of you can worship God. You can stand here and worship God and commit adultery. You can. Because why? Your own interests, your own desire, your flesh. Sin can come to us very easily if we are not careful. So here was the psalmist writing all kinds of songs to the Lord. But then when he saw the beautiful woman, he collapsed. His moral fiber collapsed completely. But when Nathan exposed his sin, he did not justify anymore. He knew one thing. He knew the characteristic of God. I want all of you to know God. Whatever you do, God is seeing you. Whether you are stealing from the company or whether you are committing adultery with somebody or you are in the office kicking leg with a woman who is not your wife, God can see. God can see. If you are having an affair, God can see. He will expose. He said, in fact, in the very chapter, he said that what you have done in private, what you have done in secret, I will expose all this out in the open. And that's exactly what happened. Sometimes I ask, Lord, you love David so much. And then why you make him so shameful, you know? For even now, he's in heaven a long time already. So many thousand years already. We still talk about him. Bathsheba took a bath. Then you tengo, tengo, and then you fall down. We still talk about that. Imagine if my story were put in the Bible and people are reading about it. Yeah. So when you go to heaven, you say, where's David? Where's David? Where's Bathsheba? Where's Bathsheba? You are going to look for these people, but they are there. The grace of God. So, Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. You know why? Because immediately he repented. The Lord is always looking for a repentant heart. Whether it's a simple sin like telling a lie 
or the sin like losing your temper, or the sin like taking something that's not yours, or the sin like watching pornography. All this, the Lord will forgive you. But you need to live a repentant life. And later on, you will understand what is living a repentant life. But you see, Nathan said, however, because by your action, by your deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Did you know that when you start to sin against God or you commit a sin against God, you know, the enemy is going to stir up and say, look at this Christian. This Jesus is not true, you know. So they use this occasion to blaspheme against God. Have you ever seen a Christian with very bad temper you know, in church, you no, know, pounding the table, scolding the pastor? It happened. It happened. Cursing the pastor. <laughs> this is the pastor that got cursed. Yeah. Right here. Angry. And I say, what's going on? Why? Because the person was so affected and, and certain policy he didn't like and he began to attack. And then he gave the occasion for the devil to do what? To blaspheme. Look at this church. Look at these people. Look at this so-called disciple of Christ. And then Nathan passed on a judgment. He said, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. The Lord says, this child came because of your union. His life was given by me. I'm not going to take him back. You won't enjoy him. Because one day you will understand that because of your sin, the Lord God is going to send His Son to die for you. Now your son died. But one day, because of this type of sin, the Lord will send His Son to die for you. But all these are implicated inside the story. And therefore, you've got to read deep inside and to understand the heart of God. Some people say, why God is so bad, you know? He killed this baby, this innocent baby. The baby came from Him, all right? The life given by Him. You may have a, a, a human, a natural union, but the life still got to come from Him. And He got the right to take it back. And so, He said, I'm going to take it back and I'm, I'm going to give you other children. In fact, David and Bathsheba had four more kids. And one of them, very famous, his name was Solomon. All right? Got four more kids. All right. So let's go to Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, you will find that there is a portion called the introduction. And the introduction says a prayer of repentance. Remember the word repentant, right? It means that to turn 180 degrees. Not 360. Uh, 360 means you turn back and do the same thing. 180 degrees, you turn away, repent. Live a repentant life. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Did you know that Nathan didn't come to him immediately? David was able to hide his sin for more than nine months. The child was born. David was still hiding his sin. Nobody knows. Nobody knows, right? Nobody knew about it. But God said, I'm going to expose it. So, in verse 1 say, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercy, blot out my transgression. So have mercy upon me. Why? Uh, not because I was good, not because I have killed Goliath, not because I was appointed a king. Have mercy upon me because of what? Your loving kindness. That you are a kind and loving God. All right? And according to the multitude of your tender mercy. Can you see? We can only plead upon the grace and the mercy of God. We cannot come to God and say, Lord, you know, this is Albert, you know, I... I opened three orphanages, you know. I, I started 20 churches, you know. So, all these accolades that you have, all these achievements that you have, God is going to put one side. Because at the end of the day, 
I told my wife is that on my tombstone, right, at the end of the day, put one word, mercy. That's it, mercy. All I need is mercy. Because if you know this heart of mine is darker than the darkest night, but by the grace of God, is now bright, is now shining because the grace has come. And I pray that all of you will recognize it. He said, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. So now you have this word transgression, iniquity, and sin. What do you mean by all this? Yeah? So he said, for I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is before me. So when you have the Holy Spirit, you see, King David didn't have the Holy Spirit inside him. He got the Holy Spirit upon him. You have the Holy Spirit inside you. You are different. You will pray differently from David. I will pray differently from David because why? The Lord God says that, you know, Jesus got to go back and he sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lived within us. If you were to listen very carefully, your heart will speak to you the voice of God. Your heart will speak to you because the Holy Spirit lives inside. But for King David, no. You see, when he sinned against God, the Holy Spirit was upon him to show him the sin always before him. When he looked at Bathsheba, he felt guilty. When he looked at his newborn son, he felt guilty. When he looked into the mirror, he felt guilty. The worst thing that can ever happen to a person is that when you live in sin, you commit sin, and you look in the mirror and nothing happens. There's no sin before you. You are staying with somebody who is not your husband, not your wife. And you are saying, no problem. Which means that you are dead. You are dead in your flesh. You are dead. Holy Spirit no longer talking. Most probably Holy Spirit not even living inside. Because you have transgressed so much until you reject. So yeah, you can continue to live in sin. You can continue to live with a woman who is not your wife or go to that man who is not your husband. You will go on. You will keep on sinning until the day that you die because Holy Spirit stop talking. Outwardly, you can be very religious. You can be worshipping. You can be jumping. You can be dancing. You can be praising God. You can do, even do healing. But the Lord knows. So I acknowledge. You have to acknowledge. You have to recognize. I have sinned. All right? I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is always before me. And that's the heart of David. I pray you listen very carefully that you have the heart of King David. All right? And then what do you say? Against you only have I sinned. Now you are going to object. What do you mean by against only God? Didn't he sin against Uriah? Didn't he sin against Bathsheba? Didn't he sin against the kingdom? Didn't he sin against all his family members? Right? Why did he say against you? Because, you see, he was accountable to this one king of kings. Because he was above all. He could overrule everybody except this king. And therefore, this king of kings, he bowed and said, against you only, Lord, have I sinned. And then, you know, and I've done this evil in your sight. Wow. He used the word evil because how desperately wicked is the heart of man. I know how desperately wicked. I can hide my own sin. I can hide my own depraved ideas. How desperately wicked is the heart of man. And so, let's understand the nature of sin. First one is called transgression. Is that word called pasha? Pasha means the willful disobedient violation of God's law. For example, if you are a grown man, you have studied the word of God, you know that the word of God is against this. You say that watch your eye, what do you see, watch your ear, what do you hear, watch your mouth, what do you speak. You are not a child. Now, if you are a two-year-old child, I can understand. But when you are a big buffalo, then what happened? You cannot say, I don't know. You know, but it's a willful disobedience. So that's called transgression. And then this violation of trust. 
not just breaking the rule, but failing to uphold a relationship with God. Did you know that when God saved you, when God appoint you, when God assigned you, He give you a trust. I trust you. I trust you to hold on to my word. I trust you to preach my word. But I reject your word. I want to live in sin. I want to commit adultery. I want to commit fornication. I want to commit all these things. I don't care about your word. That's called transgression. You know the word, but you break it. Then the other word is called sin. It's called chat, which means they're missing the mark. Like the archer who feels the heat, the target, right? And this can be intentional sin or unintentional. Maybe deliberate sin or unintentional sin, right? Means that, for example, you lose control of your emotion. And therefore, you slap your son left and right, you know, until he's half dead. Uh, just to vent out your anger. Or you kick your dog until the dog is half dead. Just to vent out your anger. So that is sin. Alright? So your relationship with God will be affected. Sin will separate you from divine fellowship. At one time, I had a problem with the Lord. Not the Lord had a problem with me, but I had a problem with the Lord. And did you know that for the few months, I couldn't hear the voice of God. I couldn't hear. And I was a young man and I was struggling with lust. And so I couldn't hear the voice of God because I was so consumed by lust. Until I surrendered that lust to the Lord. Then the voice started to speak. God will always come to you and say, I know your weakness. I know you. But would you surrender that, that I might speak to you? And I did. And the voice came back. And I was saying, praise God. Because the worst thing for the child of God is to never be able to hear the voice of God. Unless you're not a child of God. Then you say, who cares? Whether he talk or not is not important. Then I assure you, you are not a child of God. You are not. Absolutely not. Because a child of God listened to the Father. A child of God is like Jesus. He's, he adored the Father. And everything he said that, your will is my will. That's a child of God. You see, because you are the grown child of God, you are not a little, you know, child. For example, when I was six years old, my father said, uh, you've got to come to the chicken rice store to help me. I was so upset. I said, I want to play. I want to play with my friend. No, you've got to come and help daddy. So I went, but grudgingly. Seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, eleven years old, I was still grudgingly going to the coffee shop to help my, my dad. Not happy. Everybody enjoying their life except this young boy here. Yeah? I was very grumpy. My mom said, you got to go, you got to go. And then uh, I rode that little bicycle, you know, and so frustrated. Why was I born in the chicken rice family? Why, my, why can't my father be a tycoon or something like that? Then when I reached 14, something caused my eyes to be open. 15, I look at my dad and how I love him. And I say, dad, let me take over. You go home and rest. I take over. Something has changed. I have become the son. I was the child, but now I am the son. Can you see? I love my dad. Same thing. Why am I standing here still preaching? Oh, this month now, September, I'm going to be 70. Why am I still preaching? I love my father. I love my dad. I don't know about you, but I love my dad. I will preach as long as he gives me breath. I will teach as long as he gives me strength. I will continue. If he gives me a platform to preach, I will do so. Until the day I see him. But that's my commitment to my Lord. So the relationship with God can be affected if you continue to live in sin. And then you, there is another word called iniquity, which is the word called avon. It's not a cosmetic, uh, not avon cosmetic, right? So uh, this one is avon means iniquity, right? It's a moral distortion. It's a deep-seated moral wrongdoing or wickedness. It's the heart that is corrupt. This is terrible. This is not just 
a, a mistake. This is in the heart. The heart has become evil. That every time when you want to do, you, you, you look at the person, you want to do evil thing to him. For example, we learn about some of the servants in the house, the maid, right? And they hated the master so much, they hated the owner so much, that they put all kinds of things into the food. In Singapore, they caught a maid uh, putting her, her tampon into the soup. Use tampon, right? But they caught on CCTV, yeah? So, why? Because it gets so evil now. I hate my master so much. And so to get back at him, I will do all this. And then put all kinds of things into the food of the... Put soap powder, actually, into the, into the porridge of the baby. Why? Evil. This is called iniquity. So you feel guilty now, but it is your nature to sin. You cannot stop sinning. You are feeling, oh, I may have done wrong. Or you heard this sermon uh, on YouTube and you say, oh, I may have done wrong. But your sin nature has already inside you because the Holy Spirit no longer uh, does any work in you. And so, contrast with other sin, while transgression indicates willful rebellion, sin refers to missing the mark, but iniquity is much deeper. Everyone is a habitual moral feeling that reflect a heart that is turned away from righteousness, which means that deep down inside is already unrighteous. So whatever that you do, you scheme, you plan, you hurt people. All right. Even whatever that you say, you can be smiling, but the purpose is to destroy. The purpose is to tarnish. So go back to the psalm that King David talked to God. He said that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. You see, he came before God and said that, I am at your mercy. Whatever that you do, you are blameless, Lord. When you judge me, you judge me rightfully. You are blameless totally. I accept what you judge me. All right, so that is a kind of heart. The heart never argue with God, never give a reason. And he said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin, my mother conceived me. He was not talking about his mother committing adultery, then he came out. No, no, no. He's talking about his sin nature. He understood that he was born in sin. All right? So he understood that Adam and Eve, they sinned against God. And that sin nature is given to him. And so he was born in sin, in iniquity. And so in sin, my mother conceived me. It means that my sin nature... If you don't give me grace, I cannot take away the sin nature. Behold, you desire truth in the inward part. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Now, this is the heart of David. He understood something about God. God wants to see inside. At one time, I was praying and I was struggling with my sin. Yeah, I had become a Christian. But I was a young man and there were a lot of hormones raging in me. And one time I prayed, Lord, why don't you take away all the women in the world? Why? No women. Because every time I see women, I think, 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 think. My eye keep blinking. Something wrong with my eye. The eye gave. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, can you take away this lust in my eye, uh, in my flesh? And so while I was praying, I was wearing the Chinese uh, t-shirt and the round Round, uh, you know, that, that, that. So I tore my t shirt. I tore, I said, Look at my heart, Lord. Because I was so sincere. I struggled. I don't know if you have done that or not, but big struggle. Because you know what? I know that God wants to check the hidden part. Okay? That when you expose your hidden part to the Lord, the inward part to the Lord, then you know wisdom of the Lord will come. And then he said, Perch me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. He understood this truth here. Because, you know, number one thing is that hyssop is a cleaning agent. So in Exodus 12, during the time of Moses, Moses said, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put it on uh, the top, you know, the top post. And both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door 
of your house until morning. You know what? That is the Passover. Right? They killed the Passover lamb. They took the blood and they put it on the door frame, on the top and on two sides, but not on the threshold. The blood of the lamb is never on a threshold for you to step on. But it forms a covering. So as long as you are under the covering, and so what happened is that you see it says that push me with hyssop. You've got to use hyssop to apply it. So this is like a cleaning agent. You've got to use that as like a brush. Then you say, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So I was black. I was darkness. I was like midnight. But then you, when you wash me with your blood and I shall be whiter than snow. That's how David, that close to Christ. I mean, that's close to God. And then also hyssop is being used as a cleaning agent for skin diseases. So the priest shall order that two live clean birds and some um, aseda wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop be brought for the person to be cleansed, which means that the person got leprosy or the person got eczema and the person has got to be cleansed, right? The person is being healed and then he's being cleansed, but hyssop is being brought forth. And so what David was saying is that I am like a person, I'm like a leper. But the, my spirit is full of leprosy. Can you see? And I need that cleansing. I need you to cleanse me. And so, a thorough cleansing where impurities or sin are removed. When Jesus came, what did he do? He touched the leper. Did you know that when you touch the leper, you would have been unclean? Then you will need to go to the temple and be cleansed. Right, because the uncleanness of the leper will come upon you. But when Jesus touched the leper, different, his cleanliness, his purity will go into the leper and the leper will be purified. Right, he said that he reached out and touched the man, I am willing, because the leper said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He said, I am willing, be clean. Be clean. Straight away, the purity of Jesus fall through. How am I going to stay pure? How am I as a pastor, as a Christian, going to stay pure? I stay close to Jesus. I read His Word. The person of Christ, I'm close to Him. But the principle of Christ, the Word of God, I'm close to that. I read His Word every day. Why? Because I know that I need to be purified. A lot of times, dirty things will come in. Some of the weirdest things will come into the mind. But because of the purity of God's Word, it cleanses, it cleanses, it cleanses. So all the leprous mind, all the thing in the mind, all the leprosy in the mind, all cleanse away because I stay to the Word of God. The Bible says the Word of God is like water and it's going to wash and cleanse you. So don't say, Pastor, I am still being tempted. That is because you don't read the Word. I cannot stay uh, live a repentant life. That is because you do not read the Word. The Word is the one that can cleanse you. And then there's a spiritual transformation. It means true repentance is a change of heart. I turn away from the sinful behavior and I seek the righteous path of the Lord. And then it's also an emotional and a psychological aspect, right? Being healed. So beyond the spiritual, purging can also involve releasing guilt. You know how many of us would come to church guilty because we have done something wrong or we have an affair or we have some kind of relationship that's not right? Guilty! And we can't worship God. Everybody praising God, but we stand out there. How? Oh, uh, if I raise hand, also cannot. Go like that, like that. Oh, cannot. Why? Guilt. Can you see? So what happened is that when purging comes, it releases the guilt, the shame, the burden of past sin, leading to emotional healing. Hallelujah. That's what God is doing. And then it's an ongoing process. For the time of David, it's known as purging, but for us, it's known as sanctification. The Holy Spirit has come to us because of the covenant of God. New covenant is known as sanctification. And therefore, when you have the Holy Spirit, you know what, what's going to happen here? You start to sanctify. What is sanctification? Is that whatever impure things started to wash away. 
the word of God get washed away. You know why you read the word of God? It may not help you. It's because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit revealed the truth of the word of God. He said, Pastor, I read the, the word of God, uh, you know, so many chapters a day, but I don't understand because you don't have the Holy Spirit. But when you have the Holy Spirit, you can read just one chapter. And I tell you, you are cleansed. You are purified. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he said, make me hear the joy and gladness that bones that you have made, uh, have broken may rejoice. Now, we don't know if the real shepherd would do this or not. But in the Bible, many of the pastors would preach to you about this, is that sometimes when the, when the lamb or when the sheep get a little bit rowdy and disobey and start to run to the cliff, and you know that when they run to the cliff and uh, some of the sheep are not so smart, they're going to fall down to the cliff. And so because of this disobedient sheep, you know what the shepherd will do? He'll break the leg. Break the leg and carry the sheep. And so the bone that you have broken may rejoice so that you break the leg so that you are actually helping me. Sometimes God got to break your legs. So in order to help you, you say, Lord, why you allow bad things to happen to me? Because God is warning you. He said, look here, you keep doing that way, worst things are going to happen. Now I just break a leg. Next time I break your back, then you can't move. So it's up to you. So you see, David said, make me hear joy and gladness that the bone you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. How many of you have actually faced your parents? I actually, I, I, I was, when I was a child, I hated to face my mother. I love my father. My father, Chin Chai Wen, never mind. Uh, you can see all that you want, it's okay. But my mother different. She got rotan hang everywhere. All right? In no rotan, she got broom. So I became a master kung fu. I huh? just sound like, like Brother Kenny there. Because every time you use broom, I can siam, siam, siam. Right? I can, I, can, I, can, I can block. Yeah. But if she put her face to my sin, my mistake, the things that I've done wrong. Oh, finish. She's going to judge me. She's going to spank me. Right? And my mom, all she needed to do was look at us. All four of us. You know, we can be so rowdy, so, you know, so naughty. And then my mom just clear her throat. <clears> or <throat> oh, become very quiet. Why? Because if not, you see, when you go home, then you know. How many of you, when you were growing up, the mom said, when you go, go home, then you know, right? Can you still feel the fear? <laughs> right? So what David was saying, please, I don't want the rotan. Please hide your face from my sin. Don't look at my sin. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Blot out all my iniquities. Blot out. You know, right? So blotting out means erasure of my record. God removing the record of your sin as if you have never committed a sin is a clean slate, blot out. And many of you still, the devil, remind you of your past, right? For example, we had an American pastor. His son got to know a girl. And this girl has become converted, right? Real Christian, purified. But her life before was not so good. She was a prostitute. She was a, quite a famous prostitute. And many men had gone to her. But she got saved, converted. And then she fell in love with the pastor's son. And she said, I cannot marry you because of my past. And the pastor's son said, I will marry you. And so when they were about to marry, the whole church protested. The whole church protested. How can a pastor's son marry an ex-prostitute? So one day, the pastor's son asked the father for the pulpit. He came up with the girl. He said something. He said, I don't know what Jesus, which Jesus you are worshipping, but my Jesus 
His blood is powerful enough to wash away all the sin of my fiancé. Can your Jesus wash away all your sin? You see, the devil wants to remind you, last time you were doing this, last time you were doing that. But you see, the blood of Jesus will wash away. At one time, the demon, uh, we were, I was trying to cast out an evil spirit. And the evil spirit said, if I come out of her, I will enter you. So I was so scared, right? But I knew the word of God. So I said, no, you shall not. Greater is he that's in me. That first John 4, 4, right? And so he stopped that. The next thing that he said, he said, I will expose all your sin. Wow, that was the worst one. As a young man, you've got a lot of wrong things that you, you have done. He said, I will expose all your sin. And I look around, it was in the prayer room, and then all these aunties were prayer warriors. All the aunties there, prayer warriors, also part-time gossiper. So if exposed on my sin, all the gossip will be spreading out. So this young pastor, I just appointed as a young pastor, I will lose face. I got no ministry in the future because all my sin exposed. But the Lord gave me a word and said, No, you shall not. All my sin have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Give a lot of clap offering. Praise God. I want you to know that all your sin have been washed. Nothing. Even your sin this morning washed away. Today you are pure. You are clean slate because He blot out all your sin. And then there's a divine forgiveness. God's mercy and willingness to forgive you. You can start anew. Today you can start anew. Nobody can say anything about you. Oh, but this morning, Pastor, I committed adultery. Yeah? Have you repented? Yes. Then God remember no more. God will take your sin and put into the sea of forgetfulness. God cannot remember anymore. You say, Father, I, 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 I did, he said, did what? Cannot remember. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. I want you to forget all the past wrong things, even right now. If you confess your sin, what is confession, right? Confession means I come in alignment with the will of God. I confess that this is not in alignment with the will of God. I now come in alignment with the will of God. Can you see? That's called confession, right? Then repentance is what? Repentance means I turn around. I don't walk towards that sin. I turn around. At one time, there was this Augustine. Augustine was one of the early church fathers. When he was a young man, he loved to go to the brothel. He was quite rich, and so he always visited the brothel. Then he got saved. He got thoroughly saved. And so one day, he was walking on the street, and then there was a prostitute coming and said, Augustine, Augustine, it is I, it is I. And Augustine said, no, no. It's not I, it's not I. <laughs> it's no longer him, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who live in me, amen? Right? Because I've been transformed. Can you see? So God said you can start anew, even right now, even right now, okay? And God does not just remove your guilt, but He also restores you to a right relationship with God. If you have not been hearing from God, now you hear from God, okay? And then, he went to, to, this is the famous verse that we sang just now. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. All right? And so this is exactly what happened. Is that let my heart be purified by you because you are the creator. You can recreate this heart and renew once again, Lord, that steadfast spirit. It means the spirit of commitment, the spirit of steadfastness, the spirit of whereby I am dedicated to the Lord. Many of you, you love God. You love God so much. But because of your sin, they will start to back away. You know why you don't want to serve? Because malu. Oh, Pastor, I, 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 I can't serve. Pastor, I, I, I don't feel well. Actually, you don't feel well spiritually. Because why? You know God can see you have sin in your life. And then, a clean heart is free from sinful thought. So what is a clean heart? It's spiritual purity. It's free from sinful thoughts and desire. It reflects a state of moral integrity. And that's what happened. 
is that keep cleansing because we men can have the worst dirty mind, but the Lord will keep cleansing, keep cleansing, keep cleansing. And then a clean heart wants to align with God's will. A clean heart does not want to bring shame to the name of God. Suddenly you find that the name of God is so important to you. And so then he said, do not cast me away from your presence, O Lord, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Remember, cast me not away from thy presence, O God, right? Why did he sing that? Because that was last time. Old Testament time, the Spirit of God was upon a person. The Spirit can be taken off. When the Spirit came upon King Saul, right? Then what happened? King Saul sinned against God. The Spirit left. Evil Spirit came and King Saul went crazy. Can you see? So that's why David, he saw that. He began to pray. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. But this prayer, you cannot pray. You and I cannot pray. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit already inside you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be cast away. Amen? As long as you give your life to Christ, yes, you make mistakes. But the Lord treasure you. He said, I'm now not going to live in the temple made by hand, but I'm living in the temple that is made, that you are the temple. And that's why He is inside you. That's why God is so merciful. I'm so thankful. I don't have to, to, to pray this, oh, cast me not away from your presence because His presence is always with, with me. He may not speak to me, but He is there. You know, He's like the angry father, very silent, but He's there. He's watching you. There was a story whereby, you know, in Africa, there's some of the teenagers, they have to go and kill a lion. All right? And, 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 and so the teenager was left alone in the jungle and one animal would come and the teenager was so afraid in the darkness and he was supposed to kill a lion, right? But then, you know, that in the midst of a struggle, the lion died. And the teenager said, wow, I'm so strong, I'm so strong, I'm sure I killed a lion. Until the sunrise, you know, then you saw the father standing down there. <laughs> so that it was the father who helped him to kill the lion. Your father will help you to kill the lion. He's always there. You don't see him, but he's there. All right? That his Holy Spirit is always there with you. And then he said, Restore to me the joy of my salvation or your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And that's what David wanted, is that to have peace with God and to have joy. If you don't have joy, and your joy has to be depending on the how many Korean movies you have to watch, then you feel joy. Or how many of these worldly songs you have to, to sing, you feel joy. Then you don't have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is very steady. It's always there. Whether you are eating your food, or whether you are sitting there, or whether you are reading the Bible, the joy is right there. And so, David said, restore unto me, but the Lord has already restored to you. You already have the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Then I will teach transgressor your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. So David said that, look, my experience, Lord, use that to teach transgressor. No wonder God put his story in the Bible. For thousands of years, people read this story. Did you know that Jesus actually read this story too? Yeah, right? So he said, that sinners shall be converted to you, that they... They learn from my mistake and deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, oh God. So he remembered again that he killed Uriah. Set me free from that. Don't let that condemnation come in. All right? Yes, my hands are bloody. But Lord, let your blood wash me. I become as white as snow. And then he said, the God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And then you go on, O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will show forth your praise. So now back to David, the psalmist. Back to David, the worshiper. And he's worshiping God now. And then he said, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I could give it. Because all this thing, the sacrifice, like, you know, killing somebody, and going in to sleep with somebody's wife, all this cannot be offered as the sacrifice, all right? You do not delight in burnt offering. So what you need to do is say, what do you like? What do you like? He said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, 
And that's where he gave himself. That's why he became a man after God's own heart. A broken and contrived heart. This, O oh God, you will not despise. You know, while some of you are listening to the word of God, you know, God is touching you and you're feeling inside deeply. You are hurt and you, you know you sin against God. And God is saying, that is called a broken spirit. That is a contrite heart. And God loves you. And God will forgive you. And then, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Now he's back to be a king because he got a domain to reign. He said, bless Zion. Bless Jerusalem. Bless Israel. Right? And then, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of the righteousness and then with burnt offering and the whole burnt offering, then they shall offer booths on your altar. Now he's talking about his kingdom. Lord, you bless us. Our whole kingdom will worship you. Our whole kingdom will sacrifice to you. So, why did God expose David's sin? It's a teaching purpose, right? David's story teaches a strong lesson about the consequences of sin. So, if you are now still living in sin, right now, you can ask God to forgive you. But of course, you can say, I don't want. Because what? God is not going to force you. Every time you want to sin, you can keep on sinning, keep on sinning, keep on sinning. God is going to step back and say, go ahead. The consequences of sin will happen. One day, anything done in secret, one day is going to be exposed out in the open. He will, right? And so the consequences of sin. So it shows how important it is to have a moral integrity and to seek forgiveness when you mess up. When I mess up, I come to God and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm living a repentant life. And so make sure that you want to live a repentant life and being aware of your human fallibility. By documenting David's failure, you know, it's going to tell you that even great leaders can fall. And one time I talked to a young pastor. I said, young man, you are married and you are too close to this woman who is not your wife. Every time I see you and her together, young man, be very careful. He's a pastor. Young pastor. He said, Pastor, this won't happen to me. I love my wife. It won't happen to me. But it happened. The fallacy of humankind. Human being, you have feelings. When you are with a person who is not your wife or your husband, you have feelings. Oh, no problem. We are brother and sister. Oh, you have feelings. Yes, and the devil will take your feeling. Feeling, nothing but just feeling. I'm going to sing this on the bus. <laughs> Three hours. Feeling. And that feeling is going to kill you. The devil will destroy you because feeling. I've seen, I'm, 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 I've been in ministry for 40 years. I've seen so many things happen. A few years back, we just, we just ministered to a pastor. He's an older pastor around my age. Got into an affair with a woman, a, a, a church member who was in her 30s. How did it happen? Counseling. One-on-one -on -one counseling. Come lah, I counsel you lah. Then fall in love. Then commit sin. Then the girl said, you're going to leave your wife. I want to marry you. Then all this thing exploded. It came out in the open because now she wants to marry him and he wanted to run. Whatever that you do in secret, one day will be exposed. So God wants to remind us, be very careful. The human tendency towards sin is there. So watch it. And then, David repentant in Psalm 51 showcases God's mercy. The one part is that God is merciful. His story emphasizes that no one is beyond redemption if they sincerely seek forgiveness. Even an adulterer, even a murderer can be redeemed, right? Depending on God's grace and forgiveness. And so what we must do, must learn from David's model for repentance. Miss David heartfelt prayer. Today, are you able to pray from inside? Or oh, you are so angry, pastor preached this sermon, it's about me. 
Now, if this sermon poke you, uh, if the shoe fit you, uh, wear it. All right? You can hate pastor, it's okay, but you've got to wear that shoe because it fit you. Because Holy Spirit is talking to you, not pastor. You understand? But there must be a heartfelt prayer for the restoration, provide a model of how to approach God in repentance. God wants all of us to seek Him for a clean heart and that's why He sent the Holy Spirit to sanctify and to purify our hearts. Do you know why you are listening to this sermon? Is that God wants to purify you. Then you may not have a major sin, but you may have a sin of bitterness. You may have hated somebody. Somebody secretly you hate that person. And every time when you look at that person or you hear about that person, in your heart you say, I hope he dies. Oh Lord, let him die. Let him have one man rapture. Go. Die faster. If that is the case, then you need David's model of repentance. Remember your covenant relationship with God. God has a covenant with you and He wants to bless you. He gives you the spirit of covenant, that's Holy Spirit, that you can be holy, which means set apart for His glory. So He's talking about a covenant with you. If you don't have a covenant, did you know that when King David, when he looked at, when he looked at the Philistine, the Goliath, you know what he, what he said? He said, you uncovenanted individual, right? You uncovenanted. Means like you don't have a God. I am covenanted. Now, if you are uncovenanted, then I'm talking to the air. But if today you are covenanted, you have a covenant with Jesus. Jesus died for you. You believe He died for you. He's your Lord and Savior. There's a covenant with Him. Then this, man, this sermon is for you. All right? Very important. You've got to be set apart for His glory. And then the final thing I want you to know is that be a person after God's own heart. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, you have done a lot of bad things. No problem, right? Because why? You have found a merciful God. And so after removing Saul, he made David their king. And God testified about King David. He, he said what? I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Why? He will do everything I want him to do. If I want him to repent, he will repent. 